Welcome to the Synthesis of Yoga series, the book that changed my life. We are on the sixth episode. In the last episode, the fifth one, we have been on this second chapter, the three steps of nature, third and fourth paragraph was covered, where uh, Sri Aurobindo gives us the view of that very first step of nature where a living body, bodily life, that is a well-established step in evolution. Nature has already established with the stability, durability, flexibility, and suppleness, mutability, a body that is capable of a higher possibility. And mind manifested in this human mold when this was ready for expressing mental possibilities. The two principles of matter and life energy has been brought together. Matter has its immobility, life energy has its constant movement. These two opposing, paradoxically opposing principles have been brought together, brought to a working compromise of a bodily life as a stable condition upon which mind can emerge. And anything higher need to utilize these two foundations. And any yoga that attempts to reject this bodily life will not be integral yoga. Also, it will be a rejection of the greater aim of evolution. So that's what he covered in this third and fourth paragraph during the last episode. Now, let's continue to the next fifth paragraph of the second chapter, Three Steps in Nature. Equally, the vital and nervous energies in us are there for a great utility. So, before this, he was focusing on the body and the challenges of the body and not to run away from the body. And there is a utility for the body and uh, eventual divinization of the body, all that possibilities. Now he is coming to the nervous energies. Remember that foundation of living body is composed of two layers. The sthula sharira has its annamaya kosha and pranamaya kosha, the nervous envelope the nervous vehicle, the vital vehicle. The vital and nervous energies in us are there for a great utility. They too demand the divine realization of their possibilities in our ultimate fulfillment. So our human evolution and its ultimate fulfillment must include all the layers that have gone before our emergence. And this life energy, the nervous energies in us is there for a great utility. They too demand divine realization. There is a divine possibility in that pranamaya kosha and their possibilities in our ultimate fulfillment. The great part assigned to this element in the universal scheme this element is the pranamaya kosha. This, the great part assigned to this element in the universal scheme is powerfully emphasized by the Catholic wisdom of the Upanishads. The timeless wisdom of the Upanishads gives great importance to this part. Upanishad says, as the spokes of a wheel in its nave, as the spokes of a wheel in its nave. So, in the life energy is all established. Our evolutionary process unfolding, all the life forms emerging and evolving, everything is established like the spokes of a wheel in its nave. 
life energy is the hub upon which everything is arranged. Even in human body, the navel is treated as the hub of the life energy, the prana. As the spokes of a wheel in its nave, so in the life energy is all established. The triple knowledge, the sacrifice, the triple knowledge and the sacrifice and the power of the strong and the purity of the wise under the control of the life energy is all this that is established in the triple heavens. This is an ancient language. The triple knowledge here in the Upanishads is referring to the ancient Vedic Rig, Sama and Yajur Vedas. Vedas is book of wisdom. And uh, so the triple knowledge and the sacrifice, sacrifice is yajna. In the ancient days, Vedic period, it was not the word yoga that was known. It was the word yajna. When the word yajna is translated into English, the word used is sacrifice. Unfortunately, the word sacrifice cannot capture the essential meaning of the word yajna. Sacrifice somehow brings in sense of a painful giving. You are giving something, offering something. But in yajna, yajna has a cosmic significance of an offering, a sanctified offering, an offering that brings the growth, the abundance, the evolutionary possibilities. The triple knowledge and the sacrifice and the power of the strong, power of the strong is reference to the Kshatriya types and the purity of the wise, the purity of the Brahmin types under the control of the life energy is all this established the Vedas, the Yajna, the action of the power of the Kshatriyas and the purity of the Brahmins, all these are established by this life energy. By the way, Kshatriya and Brahmin, these are not castes. These are, these are some of the misconceptions of modern India. This has nothing to do with caste. These are soul types. Yeah, And also these are not by birth. Again, that's a degenerated, deformed, modern condition. This was never so in the ancient India. It is not by birth at all. It is your soul type. So the power of the strong, the purity of the wise, under the control of the life energy is all this that is established in the triple heavens. Again, the word heaven Swa, swarga. Again, this is not the conventional ideas. It's about the higher ranges of consciousness, particularly higher ranges of the mind are referred to as the heavens and there are triple range to it. So triple heavens. And at this point, we did not go into those details of triple heavens, but they are referring to the higher ranges of mental consciousness. Like the Gayatri Mantra say Bhur, Bhuva, Swar. Bhur is the earth, Bhuvar is the mid region, Swar is the heavens, which is the higher ranges of the consciousness, which is mental consciousness in its higher ranges. So Upanishads is saying, as the spokes of a wheel in its nave, so is so in the life energy is established the triple knowledge and the sacrifice, and the power of the strong, and the purity of the wise. Under the control of the life energy is all this that is established in the triple heavens. So the importance of the life energy, the prana, is brought to focus here. So it is not something to be shunned, not to be rejected, not to be afraid of. It is therefore no integral yoga that kills these vital energies. Kills these vital energies. 
There are many traditions that try to kill the vital energy through an ascetic turn because prana, the life energy, brings desire. And desire, as you know, is the troublemaker for all the yogins. All the attractions, temptations, all that comes with it. All the ashanti, the restlessness, everything that comes with it. Therefore, there are methods developed by various schools to kill it not to enjoy life. Enjoyment is not for a sannyasin, for a yogin. It is therefore no integral yoga that kills these vital energies, forces them into a nervous quiescence, or root them out as the source of noxious activities all the dark temptations, noxious activities, all our sexual desires, the greed, the lust, the cravings, the addictions, all that comes with nervous energy, the prana shakti flowing through the nerves brings them. Therefore, this difficult energy, in order to manage it, Many traditions develop various methods of suppressing it or putting them into a quiet sense, the, like peaceful, nerveless immobility that kills these vital energies, forces them into a nerveless quiet sense or root them out as a source of noxious activities so that you live in the higher planes, you don't deal with this troublesome desirous energy. So that is not the approach. If we are to have an all-round perfection and integral development, it is therefore no integral yoga that kills these vital energies, forces them into a nerveless quiescence or root them out as the source of noxious activities all the source of our evil, dark stuff in human nature, somewhere this is the seat of that. And it is not again to be rejected, but to be transformed. It is difficult, yet that is the work. Their purification, not their destruction, their transformation, Control and utilization is the aim in view with which they have been created and developed in us. So the evolutionary journey has established this nervous energies in the body with a purpose. And we need to purify and transform them not destroy. We can utilize them for a higher purpose. So their purification, not their destruction, their transformation, control and utilization is the aim in view with which they have been created and developed in us. So let us have that clear picture. All this difficult movements in us with all our guilt, shame, all that associated with our lust, cravings, attractions, temptations, addictions, and some evil tendencies, all that comes from that source, but not to be shunned. We need to face them. We need to purify them. We need to transform them, and they have a role to play. If the bodily life is what nature has firmly evolved for us as her base and first instrument, bodily life. And we looked at that two layers, body, the matter, the material, and the nervous envelope, the sthula sharira having two layers, the annamaya kosha, pranamaya kosha, corresponding challenges, but these challenges are not to be feared. This is the bodily life what nature has firmly evolved for us as her base and first instrument, 
This is the first instrumental condition. It is our mental life that she is evolving as her immediate next aim and superior instrument. So this is in the context of the three steps of nature. So the first step of nature was establishing the bodily life with its double layer of matter and life energy developing a working compromise and that is the foundation. Upon that foundation a next superior instrument that is the mind and its evolution that is ongoing. This is the second step of nature. Our mental life that she is evolving, our mental life is in the process of evolution as her immediate next aim and superior instrument, superior with respect to the previous instrumental layer that has been established. So we can see that in the human beings where the mind has developed, we have the level of creativity that is unimaginable for an animal. In animals, bodily life and its stability is very well established, rock solid, and they have health and normal healthy lifespan appropriate to each animal category. So all that is well established. Upon that foundation in human beings, which is the new layer nature has added, in which mind is evolving and that is an ongoing evolution. This is, this in her ordinary exaltations is the lofty pre preoccupation, preoccupying thought in her. Here again, it's very interesting. It is thought in nature. So I want, I want you to constantly remember back that Sri Aurobindo is writing from this perspective of this identification with nature where thoughts are part of nature. It is nature's thoughts. And we humans are her thinkers, her instruments. And nature's preoccupation, preoccupying thought, what is that thought? It is of this developing this mental capacity. That is the ongoing evolution. If the bodily life is what nature has family, firmly evolved for us as her base and first instrument, it is our mental life that she is evolving as her immediate next aim, the immediate next aim and the superior instrument. This in her ordinary exaltations is the lofty preoccupying thought in her. It is the current occupation nature is working with. This, except in her periods of exhaustion and recoil into a purposeful and recuperating obscurity, is her constant pursuit. Wherever she can get free, from the trammels of her first vital and physical realizations. Coming back to that image of nature rushing and recoiling, rushing, recoiling, even a mighty passion with which she goes forward. So she goes forward whenever she gets free from the occupation of the first vital and physical realizations. The survival level existence is the bodily life, the animal level of life, where matter and life energy is brought together, stabilized. Once that is well stabilized and that is not the concern, she rushes forward with the mental development. And that is where our human civilizational cycles come into the picture. And that's where we can see in India, various cycles of civilizations rising and falling, empires rising and falling, rising and falling. Each attempt to develop the mind. So there was, as I mentioned before, the profound intellectual development that took place in India around 2500 
And that cycle continued nearly 1500 years with all the Patanjali's, Panini's and great teachings of masters of Buddha and all the branches of science, cosmologies, everything developed in India. A profound flowering of intellectual culture that lived for nearly 1500 years. And in the, in the last 1000 years, the decline started and last 500 years, it really went down. There was a deep decline into the tamas. So there was a vast cycle of intellectual development in which there were again sub-cycles. The golden period, the Gupta period was really treated as a period when there was the, so many universities flourishing in India and so much literature, city for arts, all that built on the foundation. It is survival was no more the concern, but the flowering of culture, civilization, art, literature, poetry, music. 64 arts were flowering in India. So all that happened. And then nature it drew into another recoil because she wanted to perfect something else. And as I mentioned before, Greek civilization, we can see another peak that rose up and Roman Empire was more of a vital political empire that emerged and that too declined and fell apart. And in the last 300 years, another intellectual development, mental development cycle rapidly picked up and it is spreading globally. And we can see an explosion of mental development now unfolding through internet. Though it modestly started with the printing press and spreading of book, books across and then daily newspapers and what used to be rare capacity, the reading and writing is now a common capacity across the globe. Literacy has become basic. That means a mental development is rapidly spreading, becoming global. That intellectual capacity is spreading everywhere. That is nature's preoccupation, current ongoing preoccupation. And he's writing it 100 years ago. This is her ordinary, this in her ordinary exaltations is the lofty preoccupying thought in her. This, except in her periods of exhaustion. Exhaustion is what I meant. Like in India, there was an opulent period of creation. There was an exhaustion and a recoil. A recoil into a reposeful and recuperating obscurity. So in India, we can see that repose and recuperating obscurity of tamas into which she fell. Is her constant pursuit wherever she can get free from the trammels of the first vital and physical realizations. So our current global civilization, on one hand, is removing poverty from across the world. More and more people are growing beyond that poverty line. The opulence, the material opulence is growing. And as more and more people are capable of now looking at that which is beyond the survival, the intellectual pursuits, arts, culture, everything is flourishing and will flourish. And that's nature's impulsion, pushing things beyond. For here in man, we have a distinction which is of the utmost importance. We, the humans, her latest product, in her evolutionary laboratory, we are the latest version which is capable of expressing mind and thought and rational intelligence. Here in man, we have a distinction which is of the utmost importance. He has in him not a single mentality, but a double and a triple. So it's not just one type of mind we have. There is a double and a triple. The mind material and nervous, very material mind and nervous, that's one type. The pure intellectual mind, that is second type, which liberates itself from the illusions of body and the senses. This is something we need to 
consciously pay attention to. Our mind usually is tied to the senses, to the material world and reacting to the material sensations. And mind is emerging in that context. That is the very first layer. Very nervous response to external contacts and tied to the senses. But when the mind is able to pull itself out from the occupation with senses, it can enter into the pure intellectuality. See, from a sensory point of view, from the body and sensory point of view, sun is rising in the east, earth is stable. Now, that is undeniable truth of the senses. But when we pull out from the senses and when we use our intellectual capacity, rational intelligence, we can understand that there is a solar system, earth is going around it. This is not visible to the senses. This is a vision of the intellect. Rational intelligence can derive from the data that there is material structure that is large beyond the senses. This is the gift of the intellect, pure rational intelligence. All the developments that are happening in terms of, in terms of science and technology is a vast extension of this capacity of the rational intelligence. The pure intellectual mind which liberates itself from the illusions of the body and the senses. It is an illusion. Sun's movement, earth's stability from the sensory point of view, it's an illusion actually. So when they are able to free up from that illusions, we get the pure intellectual capacity. But this pure intellectual capacity is not there in everyone. Most people live in the first layer of the mind, which is nervous and physical. It is tied to the sensory world and lives at that level. Second layer is the pure intellectual mind. And the third is a divine mind above intellect, which in its turn liberates itself from the imperfect modes of the logically discriminative and imaginative reason. So these are the three layers of the mind that he is bringing in. Just like the intellectual mind can liberate itself from the illusions of the senses and know the world through reason. Similarly, there is a divine mind, it can liberate itself from the imaginations and constructions, discriminative imaginations, logically discriminative and imaginative reason and its picture of the world. Just like the senses are giving us a particular view of reality. Then reason is coming and telling us that is not true, this is the greater truth. It is because sun is going around, we are experiencing this movement, this earth is spinning, therefore we are experiencing the movement of the sun. So the intellectual truth includes sensory truth. But sensory truth doesn't include intellectual truth. You see the difference. One is a higher truth. But for this higher truth to be seen, intellect had to liberate itself from the entanglement with the senses and see and put the sensory perspective in its right place, where it is true in that limited framework. There is a greater truth. Now, when the intellect liberates itself from the logically discriminative and imaginative reason, then we get a, another perspective, which is different from the world as reason is telling us. That's the divine status of the mind to which we do not have access to. Even the pure reason, not all humanity have access to. Potentially capable, but only when you train your intellect, like a scientist would rigorously train the intellect so that your rational intelligence is free from bias. 
or at least you can minimize the bias and build on it. It requires training. The same way the divine mind is a potentiality, it requires training to step out of the rational processing of the mind, going beyond all the chitta vrittis of the mind, the whole thinking process of the mind, and arriving at a deeper silence so that higher divine consciousness can reflect itself. He has in him not a single mentality, but a double and a triple. The mind material and nervous. Material and nervous type of mind. The pure intellectual mind, that's the second type. And the divine mind above intellect, that's the third type. Which in turn liberates itself from the imperfect modes of the logically discriminative and imaginative reason. And that's what yoga is all about. To stepping out of this, or the very starting point of yoga is that, that logically discriminative, imaginative reason, we need to step out of that. That's why in ancient yogic books, you can always say it is not by thinking and analysis you can arrive at the greater truth. We need to end that operation itself. Mind in man is first enmeshed in the life of the body. Life of the body in which the mind is enmeshed. Where in the plant, it is entirely involved and in animal, always imprisoned. Two different words. Imprisoned in animals, involved entirely in, in the plant. So in plants, we see certain type of intelligence that can seek the light, that can find the nourishment, growth of the roots and growth of the, growth of the branches. There is an intelligence at work, but it is a mind that is entirely involved. Whereas in animals, that involved mind has emerged, but it is still imprisoned. Imprisoned within what? It is imprisoned within its sensory range. Animals respond to immediate sensory environment. It is imprisoned within the sensory range and its nervous envelope. It's enmeshed in it. And that is also something that we possess. Mind in man is first enmeshed in the life of the body. In the life of the body, where in the plant it is entirely involved. The mind, the plant is entirely involved. In animals, it is always imprisoned. It accepts this life as not only the first, but the whole condition of its activities and serves its needs as if they were the entire aim of existence. So for an animal, the entire aim of existence is to serve its life impulses. So is a plant. It lives within that framework imprisoned. Even the mind, even though it is there in the animal, it is imprisoned within that framework of life and its necessities, impulses, its cravings, its drives. It accepts this life as not only the first, but the whole condition of its activities. All the activities of animals and plants is within that framework and serves its needs as if they were the entire aim of existence. But the bodily life in man is a base, not the aim. Here is where we begin to differentiate from the animal. This bodily life is a base, it's not an aim. Though vast majority of people live within the life impulse of eating, mating, sleeping, playing, procreating. And that's what most people do. Do not go beyond that into a higher level of development, culture, arts, literature, poetry, music. All that will become possible when you go beyond the basics of survival of the bodily existence, bodily life. 
The bodily life in man is a base, not the aim. His first condition and not his last determinant. It's only a first condition. It cannot be the last determinant. It cannot determine what he will do. It can only be a foundation. In the just idea of the ancients, man is essentially the thinker, the manu. Manu is an ancient name. Manu literally means the thinker, the mental being who is the thinker. It's interesting that the word manu and man comes from the same roots. In the just idea of ancients, man is essentially the thinker, the manu. The mental being who leads the life and the body. the mental being who leads the life and the body. It is the mental being who is expected to be the leader, whereas our body and life energy are to be subordinated, to be guided by our mental being because we are essentially mental beings. In the just idea of the ancients, man is essentially the thinker, the, man, the manu, the mental being who leads the life and the body. But our challenge is our bodily demands and life energies and its demands will hijack the mind and its thinking capacity and the life energy of the Rational intelligence end up serving the life cravings and life demands and life impulses and bodily needs. And we need to come out of it. And first step is for the mind to become the leader. And we begin more and more to live in the mind independent of the nervous and physical obsession. In our natural state, there is a nervous and physical obsession, even an addiction that happens. And we begin to live more and more in the mind independent of the nervous and physical obsession. And in the measure of that liberty, in the measure of that liberty, are able to accept rightly and rightly to use the life of the body. So only to the degree to which we can liberate the mind, we can really accept and live within this body in the right way. In the measure of that liberty, are able to accept rightly and rightly to use the life of the body. How to use the life of the body instead of letting the life of the body to drive our mind. A mind serving the life of the body, it has to be reversed. Life of the body is to be put into the right purpose based on the larger liberated intelligence. A freedom, not a skillful subjection, is the true means of mastery. Mind and its limited mental will can subject this life energy and bodily life to a certain extent, but it is not really the mastery. It is only in freedom this mastery can come. And not a skillful subjection is the true means of mastery. We will not go into that freedom part of it right now. But it is very obvious when we observe. We can try to control the life energy and bodily needs. But it, they often bounce back and throw out our control. And there are other ways to become truly free and master these energies. Otherwise, we can all that we can have is a skillful Subjection, and that's not enough. A free, not a compulsory acceptance of the conditions, the enlarged and sublimated conditions of our physical being is the high human ideal. A free, not a compulsory acceptance of the conditions. The bodily life lays out its conditions. 
it must be a free, not a compulsory acceptance of the conditions. The enlarged and sublimated conditions of our physical being is the high human ideal. So we need to enlarge and sublimate the conditions of the physical being. Our bodily life and its conditions, we need to enlarge it and sublimate it. That will be a higher human ideal. All our art, music, poetry, literature, everything is an attempt to refine and enlarge and expand. But beyond this intellectual mentality is the divine. Even all this intellectual development of our cultural development and refinement, it is still an intellectual height we can reach. It is still not the divine possibilities in human nature. So, here are the three levels. The mind that is involved, enmeshed, and then the pure intellectuality, and beyond that, the divine possibility. And to the degree to which the intellectual mind, intelligence liberates itself, it can master the life energy and the physical life, and sublimate it, enlarge it, expand it. But it is still not the divine life. Divine possibility, that is beyond. So with that, we are coming to the end of the sixth episode. Thank you for your loving attention. Please give me your feedback, your suggestions, and don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. Next episode will be released on coming Wednesday. Thank you. Mm -hmm.